for our OCLC colleagues who came from even from Germany and France, Spain, Italy. So really nice to have you all here. Um, I will introduce the theme. Um, and we've had some... So we had also, uh, we are recording the presentations um, so that after the session, if you go home, you can uh, listen to it again and other people can also enjoy um, the presentations. So first, let me introduce um, uh, OCLC Research. Uh, many of you know, of course, OCLC Research, but maybe some of you don't know exactly what we're doing. Um, so there is within OCLC a membership and research division. And um, within research, we, um, we do research for the library community around the world. Um, it's research and development. We also have a, a network which is called the Research Library Partnership. And this is the network where research libraries and university libraries can collaborate with each other and with OCLC research on innovative practices and challenges that they are uh, facing. And then we also have a program which is called Web Junction, and that is a lifelong learning program for library professionals. So that is in a nutshell um, what we offer as OCLC research to the community. And then we also have, of course, um, OCLC membership which is also part of our division. Um, and um, it's a worldwide membership. As you can see here, we are divided in the which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and um, Asia Pacific, which also um, uh, includes Australia and New Zealand. Um, so uh, each region has representatives from the library membership. Um, we call them delegates, and they are um, working in regional councils. And they very much guide and inform our work at OCLC. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this because, wait sometimes, yeah. Because actually the whole theme of open, open content and open access is a theme that came from our delegates, from our global council de delegates, who each year decide on a topic that they think um, is really important to libraries at, in that specific um, uh, time. It's a topical theme. Um, and open access uh, is, of course, something that is really um, uh, gaining momentum so uh, especially in uh, in the in in Europe um is very important becoming very important it was also something that came from the european council uh, delegates so um i was involved as research uh, staff to help membership and uh, global council to to open the conversation or to start a conversation about open access and open content and we did a survey, and I'm going to give you some results of the survey. I'm going to talk about the survey as an introduction to the theme. And so here are our um, Global Council delegates who were on the program committee with whom we devised and developed the survey. And so we first discussed open access is maybe a little bit too narrow a definition. Uh, we wanted to broaden it to open content because not all libraries in all the regions of the world have the same, um, uh, the same challenges with open access. Um, and open content is much broader. It's not just um, scientific publications necessarily. Uh, it can be also digitized collections, for example. It can be research data sets. It could be um, any freely available resource on the web that is interesting to, uh, to provide access to. And um, that is of interest to not just research libraries, but all types of libraries. And um, indeed, we wanted to be inclusive with um, all types and sizes of libraries across the globe, because that is our membership. So our survey, in fact, was not just about open access, but it was really uh, quite broad. It was about the full range of freely available online content. 
And the purpose was really not um, a scientific survey in the sense of, uh, of how we understand how a survey should be uh, uh, happening. Um, it's not a, a quantitative um, measuring of anything. The purpose was really to start that conversation and to involve libraries around the world in that conversation. And um, so we tried also to align um, library terminology about open content. You know, when when you when you have all your services, when you look at your services within your own library, how would you define your open content services? Um, and so that that was an interesting conversation that we had, and we wanted to make sure that libraries across the world would understand what we mean by these activities, and that they would um, start using maybe that terminology as well. So we wanted to provide a framework. Another aim, uh, goal was to explore in how far libraries are able to um, qu quantify their investment in open content. So um, how much budget do they have for open content activities? How much budget do they have for um, Op not only open access uh, licenses or whatever, but um, all their activities. It's, it's FTEs and it's budget and it's project money, or maybe it's not nothing. Maybe there is no source of investment. So these are the 14 categories of open content services that we defined. Um, and I don't know if you can read it in the back of the room, but um, you can see reading it, that uh, it's quite broad, again. Uh, it encompasses all the activities of a library, basically, from acquisition to, um, to cataloging and to uh, uh, preservation, discovery. So it's all these services. And of course, a national library will look differently at these categories than a public library or a, a research library. Um, for example, data services is number five here, and that would be typically for a national library. It would be maybe making its uh, bibliographic data um, available as linked data, for example. That would be data services. But for a research library, that would be more research data management type of activity. So we collected data between November and uh, January. We had 705 respondents from 82 countries, which is really quite a lot. Um, and um, of course, the pool of respondents was self-select. So they chose themselves to react to the survey invitation. And um, because uh, they come from so many different countries, we had a lot of responses, only one response for one country. So there is, of course, um, it is difficult uh, from a pure scientific point of view to make any um, uh, uh, statements around this survey. And you should really listen to these respondents more as individual voices than as you know, a group of homogeneous, balanced uh, representatives of libraries. But still, the data is rich, and um, we are able to do interesting things with it. Um, first of all, I should say two, there are two big imbalances, and one is that most of the respondents, 49%, um, came from the Americas region. So um, there is a bias, of course, here with the data. If you look at it as, the, as a total, then there is a bias towards the Americas. There's also a bias towards research libraries um, because 72% of the respondents were from uh, university libraries and research libraries. And the other categories are uh, not so well represented. So these are the total, uh, the findings of the total respondents, and I'm not going to give you any detailed information here on this because, first of all, it's probably not even readable for you. 
Um, but we're going to, um, to publish this. So if you're really interested in the data, and it is interesting data, um, I would encourage you to, to look at what we are going to publish about this. Um, but just very broadly, what I would like to say with this slide is that most libraries are involved, indicate that they are involved in open content activities. And in most of these 14 activities that we offer them to choose from as well. So um, there is a lot of activity going on within libraries of all sorts and in all regions around open content, much more than we had thought there would be. There's also um, great investment in it. Um, although libraries have difficulty to, um, to be able to say, I'm, I'm, I'm investing so much of my budget in open content, I'm investing so much in paid content, because that's difficult to, uh, to distinguish, because that's not the way they budget uh, the planning. Um, but um, nevertheless, they were able to say, um, not how much percent, but they were able to say that for each of these activities, how much is um, covered by budget line items, how much is covered by FTE allocations and, pro and project money. So there is a lot of data out there. They are also assessing their um, services. So they are able to say if they are very successful or somewhat successful or not successful, which is also great news. And um, so there are also some regional differences. But again, I'm not going to go into these details now for this session. Because, <clears throat> because of the richness of the data, we need also to scope and to, um, to have an interpretative framework. So scoping to universities and research libraries is an obvious choice because that's where the, most of the respondents come from. And you can see here that then the top activity within university libraries is the institutional repository, which is probably not a big surprise to most of you. And then comes supporting users and instruction and then promoting the discovery of open content. Um, there is a difference. In the Americas, in the United States in particular, uh, promoting the discovery of open content would be top one. And in uh, Europe and uh, Asia Pacific, it would be the institutional repository would be top one. So there are some regional differences here. I would like to offer you a framework to analyze the data. And this is a framework that, um, that comes from Lorcan Dempsey's um, uh, thought, uh, thinking about uh, collections. And he talks about three trends in library collections. Um, one is the inside out collection. The other is the facilitated collection. And the third is the collective collection. I don't know in how far this terminology is well known, um, but I will give a short definition of each. So the inside out collection is really the trend within university libraries and research libraries that um, more and more effort is going into um, supporting researchers locally at the own institution, the parent institution, to publish. Uh, they support, libraries support researchers and students to, to do their research, uh, uh, to deposit their research outputs, whether they are data sets or publications or preprints or whatever, software. Um, and they, um, they facilitate all these activities. And in that way, they are developing an inside-out collection, a collection that, that is born inside the institution and that they then make discoverable to the rest of the world. And that is in contrast to the outside-in collection, which used to be the way libraries collected, and that is collecting what is being published out there for the users within the institution. That is the outside-in. The facilitated collection is really, I realize that I'm talking, but you're not even, 
uh, hearing my uh, the amplifier, I think. Um, I really have to talk into the <laughs> Okay. Um, so the facilitated collection is more about um, resources, uh, information resources that are not in the library, that are not part of the collection of the library, um, but that are, that they are facilitated by the library to give access to, to your own research community. And then thirdly, the collective collection. That is the collection that um, libraries collectively have and manage and care for and steward and curate and so forth. And typically that is the print collection. That's also where typically libraries cooperate most around print collections with interlibrary loan, with shared cataloging, with all the traditional shared um, activities around print collections, but also increasingly um, digitized print collections. I mean, print collections that are digitized. And these digitized collections, again, are, um, can be seen as collective collections of libraries um, around which their um, uh, uh, new workflows are created and uh, needs uh, that, are, that are similar for all libraries where sharing uh, workflows and sharing and being more efficient about it is possible. Okay. I hope that it's clear enough now, the difference. So now looking at the, uh, the data of the, the survey with that lens of the, um, and I have here the facility, but it should be the inside out collection. This is the lens, looking at the data with the lens of the inside out collection. So it's really research support. And we see that the institutional repository support of authors and producers within the university and publishing open content and RDM services are um, all four of them are activities that are um, quite quite successful um, quite well resourced um, and um, the libraries say that r the right scale for them is uh, to achieve impact is the local scale, is institutional scale. Um, data services is probably less successful, um, but it's clear that libraries uh, significantly want to accelerate those services. Those services are the, at the top priority. And again, this is not news, I think, for, for us. Uh, we knew this, but it's nice to see that the data is actually is actually confirming what we already see as a trend. Then we have the facilitated collection. And here, um, that is supporting users to find open content, that is selecting open content not managed by my library, and that is promoting the discovery of open content. And here, what is interesting to see is that selecting open content not managed by my library is the least resourced, is the near least successful, and has the lowest score for acceleration. So it seems that libraries are becoming less interested in selecting open content that is not managed by them. Uh, but on the other hand, promoting the discovery of open content is important to them, um, even if it is not so well resourced and not so successful, they do want to accelerate. Thirdly, the collective collection. Um, and this is really about the theme of today. So um, this is about digitizing your collections. It's about digital libraries as systems where you keep those digitized collections where you manage them, where you curate them, where you make them discoverable, um, and the deep interactions with open content. Um, and here you see that the first two, digitizing and keeping those digital libraries, are quite successful, and that libraries want to accelerate. Um, deep interactions is the least mature. It's, quite, it's an activity that is uh, quite new. Um, not yet so successful, but most planned. It's one 
of the activities that libraries say they really want to start doing next year or in two years, and they want to accelerate. And they also expect help from OCLC in that area, which is interesting. Okay, so that has introduced the theme of today which is about discovery and use of open digitized collections. And um, so the shift to open has led to uh, digitizing a lot of uh, analog materials and making them open by uh, managing the, the rights, the rights issue, and freeing that, making it public domain, um, and leading to a lot of content that is freely available for reuse. But what is made open is not automatically accessible. And that is something that we are, it's becoming more and more clear that that is becoming an issue and a challenge. So um, the impact of having open collections is only um, doable, achievable, if uh, you, uh, you accelerate also the visibility, you increase the visibility and the findability. So that's where we are going to talk about triple, triple IF, um, about, um, for example, also making your collections more visible through Wikimedia projects, uh, registries, and so on. So there are plenty of initiatives in this area which are interesting to follow. And well, this is an example of from our international link data survey. Um, of uh, how libraries are publishing uh, their data as linked data, in which areas. And um, you find that digital collections is not the, the largest area. Obviously, for libraries, bibliographic data and descriptive metadata will score higher. But still, digital collections is there. It's there, and it's growing. Um, Supporting digital scholarship with reuse, that is what we call deep interactions with the content. And um, in yet another survey that we did, that was a survey on research library innovations, um, support for digital scholarship and digital humanity scored as follows. In, you know, the question was, what are the top most challenging and ripe for innovation activities? And these are the answers from Canada. It was the first topmost um, challenging innovation um, with 64%. In Australia, New Zealand, it was second. In the UK, it was second. In Europe, it was third. So um, all of them in the top three, together with other challenges like RDM. Typically, RDM was also one of the top three challenges. So, there is the program for today. Uh, so first we'll talk about prom promoting the discovery of open collections. And uh, Shane, um, my colleague from OCLC, uh, will, will uh, tell us about developments with the Content DM product development. Antoine Isaac will uh, talk about the developments at Europeana and Paul Gooding um, on the Global Digitized Dataset Network. And then after a short break, uh, we'll talk about deep interactions with open collections um, and our experiences at the CATFIS uh, project that uh, OCLC is doing together with uh, the TU Eindhoven and uh, University of Amsterdam. So, and then we'll have uh, uh, lunch. And uh, during the session, uh, please feel free to stand up and take a drink. Uh, behind, in the corner, there's also a fridge with uh, some juices and tomato juice and apple juice and so on. So if you'd like to have something else than water and tea, you are uh, free and welcome to take some there. So um, Shane, can I ask you to uh, take over? And please, um, can you introduce yourself very shortly?